in our program on global aspects of IP. Um, each of our panelists is going to introduce themselves and also their perspective, uh, their, the perspective which basically frames uh, their analysis, their approach, and their some practical best practices. Um, as you know from past programs of this uh, uh, the e-commerce uh, program at Stanford, um, this is a, a best practices and practical tools, interactive panel. Um, we're very fortunate to begin um, with Brett Allen of Dropbox, previously at Apple, simplifying um, some simplifying the patent side of the uh, of the equation, and it's it's a nice segue from the presentation that you've probably attended this morning. And I, Scott, uh, it was a, an excellent uh, presentation uh, on the uh, uh, software patenting, method patenting, enforcement, and issues which arise. Um, Brett's going to talk from the uh, prosecution perspective, um, some new ways to approach patentability utility models um, and other jurisdictions. I should begin by saying I'm, I'm Andrea Rush, delighted to be here. I'm, I'm a Canadian and uh, so always interested in global IP issues. I was in the Supreme Court of Canada a year and a half ago and the first question that I was posed to the Canadian lawyers was, US law, foreign law, if you quote it, tell us why it matters. And, and so I'm very much uh, looking forward to listening to what our panelists have to say and to hear why it matters to all of us in our practice. Over to Oh, thank you. So I'll introduce myself quickly and then we'll come back. Is that right? Okay. So uh, my name is Brett Alton and uh, I've been at Dropbox almost two years. Um, we are primarily focused on creating a safe place for your stuff um, that's easy to access. We have a few major product offerings, the Dropbox syncing and sharing functions, as well as the carousel sort of photo sharing function as well. It's another product that was launched in April. Um, and uh, I think, you know, what I'll talk about today is about uh, ways or some of the challenges around software patents, but maybe an overlooked option for protecting software that addresses some of the concerns people have around software patents. So well, with that, I'll pass it over. Hi, I'm Heidi Garfield. I'm corporate counsel at Shutterstock. I've been at Shutterstock for just under two years. Um, at Shutterstock is a uh, digital content marketplace. Um, in very simple terms, it's stock photography. Um, sorry, but no worries. Um, but it's a lot more than stock photography. We are. Um, for photos, uh, video, and uh, as of a few weeks ago, we're now licensing music. We also um, own SkillFeed, which is a two-sided uh, tutorial marketplace showing videos on you know useful subjects like such as how to use Photoshop, that kind of thing. Um, we have Shutterstock, which is our core brand, Offset, and Big Stock, one of which is a premier brand for licensing images, and uh, Big Stock, which is a more uh, discounted discount friendly brand. Uh, we are crowdsourced content. We, we get our content in a crowdsourced fashion. So uh, content protection issues and global content management issues are very important to us. We have 50,000 contributors in, uh, I think it's 100 different countries. We support 20 different languages. So uh, global IP issues are very pressing. Thanks, Heidi. Uh, I'm Mark Owen. I'm from Taylor Westing in London. I'm a private practice lawyer, always been a private practice lawyer. Um, I have spent some time out here. I, the first time I met Mark Lemley was when we were both new associates at Brown and Bain, if anyone can remember that for um, back in the day. Uh, I always done a lot of technology work as a result of that, um, but these days also do quite a lot of work on the other side of the, the fence, to the extent there is still a fence uh, for content companies. Um, in terms of international, my, my career, I guess, is based on there being the need for international approaches to IP. Uh, it used to be that we could be fairly glib about thinking, well, it's probably going to be the same answer in lots of other countries and not really worry about the differences. Increasingly these days, that's not really a safe assumption. Uh, and so I suppose my approach is, is not take things for granted and, and respect um, the fact that there's going to be different approaches, both cultural and legal. I'm Karen Thorland. I'm from the Motion Picture Association of America. Um, I'm Global Content Protection Council, and um, 
we represent obviously the six motion picture studios in the US, but we do represent them globally. And we have regional offices in Europe, um, in Asia Pacific, in Latin America, and Canada. And we're also members, or our, our members are members of a number of other um, content protection organizations around Europe. So my position involves thinking about what are the different tools that are available to protect our members' contents in different parts of the world, and what ones make sense for us to try to use to assist them in protecting their content, and we have to weigh in that both the legal and the political environment. So that, that's the perspective from which I come, from that, come to these issues, is really a copyright protection perspective, although I do have thoughts on service providers and issues that they should be concerned about as well. Hi, I'm Dan Doherty, and uh, my apologies, I was a few minutes late, obviously, but I'm an associate general counsel at Monster uh, Cable. We're a consumer electronics company. Prior to that, I was uh, associate general counsel at eBay, head of the IP group there, the non patent I group there, and uh, prior to that, I was at Yahoo for four years. So have worked uh, in the e-commerce online space for several years. So uh, <clears throat> for those of you who thought you could get away from a patent talk today, uh, not so lucky, I'm afraid. So what I'm going to talk about is uh, some of the problems that people have typically uh, and some of the concerns that they have uh, had with respect to software patents and suggest that maybe utility model protection actually may be an old solution for a new problem. And what I'll do is I'll talk about the, the three basic software patent concerns, a little history of utility models, a few examples, what I regard as the primary challenge of utility models, and a few tips. These are the three, uh, three common patent criticisms around software. One, that the term is too long, the examination is too slow, and that prior art is hard to find. And it turns out that utility models have reduced terms. They actually are often not examined, and if they are, they are um, very rapidly examined. And if they're not, you can actually get a enforceable right in a matter of months. Um, and then the other uh, problem that I think it solves is that prior art is hard to find when it comes to software. And part of that is that it's expensive and slow to actually generate a lot of art using the patent system. Utility models actually help address that because they're faster and they're cheaper, and they can, uh, they can uh, provide a great repository to improve uh, the quality of assets. Uh, you should understand, or at least when I talk about utility models, they actually go by many names. Um, sometimes it's a utility certificate, an innovation patent in Australia. Um, there's another name I won't attempt to uh, pronounce in Germany and Austria. Uh, but there are a lot of different similar vehicles worldwide, and these are all possible. Many of them are going to be possible for protecting software. And very briefly, the first utility model was, uh, was uh, created under... Uh, German law back in 1891. Japan was the first to follow in uh, 14 years later. And then now there are more than 50 countries worldwide that have some form of utility model law. The biggest challenge, though, is that the laws vary significantly in almost every respect. Now, they are covered by some treaties, but the actual substantive practice and law in every country uh, varies wildly, which makes it a strategic nightmare. So now I'm just going to talk about a few different countries that I think are sort of good proxies for the utility model uh, as a way of protecting software and some of the problems they represent. So Germany is a pretty good example. They were first, and you cannot, and, and just so if you're not familiar with the utility model, it's very similar to a patent, except if you were to look at it and read it, it would look like a patent to most people. The big difference is sort of the laws underlying it, sort of how you get them, 
and uh, the term and the subject matter eligibility, which I'll go into. Um, but in Germany, if there's a technical problem, you, and it can be solved by technical, technical means, protection's possible. So that's great, it, it, but there is a prohibition against covering programs for computers. So like many European uh, countries, you can't simply get a patent on a program for a computer, but there are ways to get around that using clever claim drafting. And the, the threshold for patentability is very similar for patents and utility models in Germany. But that's not true in every country. In, Aust in Australia, the Patents Act doesn't really distinguish between patents and innovation patents. Those are the two, the two uh, options there. Um, but in, very importantly, in, Aus in Australia, there's an innovative step as opposed to an inventive step required for patentability. That's extremely important if you want the highest likelihood of um, successfully defending a validity challenge based on non-obviousness or novelty. Um, this, is, this is actually a huge advantage in Australia. And another advantage is that they are not open to pre-grant opposition proceedings. So if you need fast protection and you don't need it slowed down by any of those opposition proceedings, they present a great option. Uh, I should mention that they're struggling with similar issues that we are in the United States, but in general, people don't think it's gonna change much. Uh, utility models should be available to protect any form of software, just like in, in the immediate future. In France, uh, it's possible also to protect it. In fact, in their, um, they, they had this one uh, case, uh, inf Infamil, which actually was a patent case, but they don't really distinguish eligibility uh, between patents and uh, utility certificates. But really it was a, what I would think many people would regard as a business method in the United States, but by uh, saddling it with a little bit of structure and in requiring that there's some comparison step of comparing uh, predefined files, they were able to get it past the subject matter eligibility problem and then, um, unfortunately, as we see in many utility model pro uh, challenges or issues, is that uh, there was no problem on the subject matter eligibility, but there was no inventive, it was insufficient inventive activity. This is a big problem we see in a lot of countries that don't treat utility models with sufficient respect, in my opinion. In Taiwan, it's possible to get to cover software, but you have to combine it with hardware. Um, and it's possible, and there's been a lot of cases that have been, uh, uh, that have been, uh, that have involved utility models or I in Taiwan, but interestingly, almost none of them have been rejected because of subject matter eligibility problems. They've all been effectively um, found invalid because of non-obviousness type issues. Uh, so I think in some ways they're getting it right, keep the subject matter eligibility very broad, and have a high standard for what's regarded as patentable. In China, which is my last example, um, they basically go in the other direction. They have slowly kind of clamped down on what they regard as eligible subject matter. And although you're allowed to claim hardware plus software together, if they decide that the inventive aspect is in the software, they won't grant you the utility model. So um, China, I think, represents the most restrictive sort of situation. And, I, and today, I can't, I can't advise anyone to pursue software protection in China using utility models. Here's the big challenge. I think if you're in-house and you're trying to figure out how can I use utility models to quickly obtain protection for my internet inventions, my software on cell phones, on computers, wherever, is that there is so little harmonization across these jurisdictions that it's a nightmare to actually manage this strategy. So there's hugely varying subject matter eligibility, the inventive threshold changes in every country, and what's regarded as ready to enforce is also quite variable. 
Here's my last slide. Practice tips. Um, the reason we see a lot of utility models fail, I think, is because people take their sort of least important inventions and they use them and they, they, they say, well, they're not quite patentable, so I'm going to try to pursue protection using utility models. But what they've done is they've selected their least likely uh, invention to succeed and then you see in all of these enforcement actions a failure based on low in, or, or insufficient inventive step. I think that's a problem. I think it's a great model. It's a great, um, no pun intended, a great option to protect software inventions, although you don't need to, um, you shouldn't be just deselecting all your best inventions. Yes, Scott. That's a great question. Um, that's actually kind of my second point. Um, many countries permit dual filing strategies, so you can do both patents and utility models. In some countries, both can issue, they can be almost identical, and you don't run into any problems. Germany is a great example, Australia is another. In other countries like Korea, um, if you get a utility model with the same scope of protection that you do with a patent, not only will your utility model go down in flames, but it, it's my understanding that both rights could be found invalid. So there's some risk, depending on the country, on whether you pursued this dual filing strategy. That's a great question. Uh, the other thing I would mention is utility models are only, um, uh, they're, they're, they're rarely examined, some countries do, uh, but you have a choice in many cases to get a quick certification which involves a search. That the search results can then be pulled back into your broader patent strategies to get better quality assets worldwide. It's a great opportunity and as long as you're very cognizant of sort of what they are, I think they fill the gap for fast uh, short-term protection that right now patents have a hard time achieving. Um, so, basically the difference between a patent and a utility model is just sort of the cover sheet that you slap on it. So if you're pursuing uh, a patent application in many countries and you want to supplement it, or if you want faster protection, then it really doesn't cost any more to, to pursue utility model protection. The examination fees are effectively null, it's cheaper, all the official fees generally are cheaper. Um, and it can be much faster. So I, I don't think it adds too much of an additional cost if you're only thinking of pursuing utility model protection but not patent protection, then you can, you could maybe, it might be more than you might expect. Yeah. Actually, I have yeah. a question. Yeah. Um, is there an advantage if uh, you're concerned with open source licensing and uh, also the impact on patents if you choose instead it sounds like an open question. Um, yeah, most of the licenses I've seen refer, either expressly talk about patent licenses or sometimes they, they just say the right to use. So if it's the right to use, it arguably would cover any exclusive rights you have, including utility models. Um, but yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. Great, great question. So I think that's all I wanted to talk about today. I, I just I also wanted to mention there's a great resource here that I found that was uh, super helpful in understanding the history of utility models, just in case you're interested. Sure. So another topic that we want to talk about, and it relates uh, well to what Brett was talking about, was um, there's been some discussion about um, utility patents in China sort of acting as a provisional patent. And it's not the same thing. There isn't a provisional patent per se in China. 
but I think where the analogy comes from is that um, there are some similarities in, in, in that there's not really, as Brett said, there's not really an examination at the time. You know, there's, there's a review to make sure that the formalities are met in terms of filing the, the utility patent, but there's not really the analysis of, of what's being applied for. And you can, in China, within a 12-month period, file for uh, uh, an invention patent, and you actually can expressly abandon the prior utility patent. But the key distinction is that you know it really is a patent application, and if nothing is done, it will actually mature into a patent. And so, the concern that that has been raised around this is, um, you know, there's been a fair amount of discussion about how non-practicing entities may use that as an opportunity, um, or competitors using it to to file for utility patents, uh, you know, in a space where they're being competitive, and so. I think there's less of a concern, well, well I think one, one peculiarity is that uh, with, re, with respect to utility patents being used against Chinese entities, um, there seems to be less of a concern about that. The, the feeling from, from folks that I've spoken with is that you know, it would be done more so to harass U.S. companies rather than, than Chinese companies. And the feeling being that um, there are judges, not juries in China. and so. You know, perhaps less likely to be swayed by the existence of a patent trying to be asserted against a Chinese entity, and uh, you know, I don't have personal experience with um, a competitor asserting utility patent against uh, against a patent that you know that's or against a company that I've worked for. But the concern is that, that this is something that's coming down the road because of of the inability. Uh, well, because of the ease with which you can get one and the difficulty. In, in terms of you know getting them invalidated, they are a patent that can be asserted. So those are we wanted to raise that issue. Uh, I did speak with one entity, which is sort of a defensive collective. They purchase patents on behalf of their members. You know, they offer insurance on behalf of their members. They had not seen that, and I really view them as as being sort of at the forefront of of these sorts of issues. They shared the concern. They felt like this is something that could be an issue down the road, but it wasn't something that they had personally experienced. And I don't know if Brett has anything that he wants to add to that. No, I, I think that sounds right. Um, I mean, uh, so if, if we're talking about like the concept of provisional rights in China, so you can assert provisional patent rights prior to issuance of a traditional utility patent, just kind of like in the United States where you can claim damages back to publication if, you're, if your claims don't significantly change through issuance. Um, and I think there's a lot of ways to deal with those kinds of assertions. If you get a, if you get a uh, uh, sort of a letter saying you infringe my patent, even though it's not yet a real patent, just a publication. Um, you know, I, I had written an article a long time ago on the concept of assessment agreements, where if you get these letters, you can actually push back and say, you should, you know, we may take a look at this, but you have to sign all your rights away all your provisional rights away, and then if you get a patent, we'll talk later. So there's, there, are, there are ways to minimize your risk in that sort of provisional rights period that actually helps you take the most, the biggest risks off the table early without too much risk. Okay, well our, our next three speakers uh, share an approach of content licensing and content enforcement and we'll talk from different perspectives, uh, also compare different jurisdictions. Okay, is this working? Can you all hear me all right? Okay, great. Um, so I'm gonna uh, just set the scene for, for some content issues uh, that um, the way it's done in the EU. Uh, there was a really interesting debate at the start in the first session this morning, if, if you were there, between Fox and Google specifically, but others as well, about you know the rights and wrongs of, of who should be to blame for, for illegal content online, the position for intermediaries, and, and the liability position on the DMCA. Um, and there was reference to, well, the DMCA protects billions of things worldwide. Um, the DMCA, though, is just an American thing, and it doesn't affect what goes on in Europe, and there's however many 400 million people in Europe. And all the content issues that, that arise, which are similar to the sort of battles which we're going on over here, come under a slightly different and subtly different regime under various semi-harmonized EU laws. So we've got 
a series of directives, some of which apply to everything, some of which there's some, there's some leeway within member states. Um, and there's two main principles, I guess, which come out of these directives which are, which are relevant to this. And the first is that there is a safe harbor for hosting. So if you're hosting UGC, whatever scale, there's a safe harbor for you. But once, you, once you're aware that there's, that there's infringing content on there, you've got to do things about it. Um, there's no, and this, it says this in the directive, there's no general obligation to monitor. So you, as, a, as a, any kind of intermediary, you're not in a general obligation to monitor for infringing content. However, the directive does say, but you can have specific obligations to monitor. And one of the areas where there's been a lot of debate is, well, what, what's the line here? And, and how, do you, how does that evolve? And, and what seems to be coming out of the, the case law, which is, which is very developing at the moment, we're in a very early stage, I guess, of our kind of pan-European constitution, is that it's a, it's a movable feast. And as technology evolves, the intermediaries are being expected to do more with that technology to block infringing content and to look out for it, at the same time as a lot of obligations are being put onto rights owners to identify stuff. Um, the second principle is we have an idea of no-fault injunctions. So if there's a, a, a platform that's hosting some content and in, or, or an ISP or that, that's allowing access to, to an infringing site in some way, even if they're not bound up in it at all, they're just simply providing the access, an injunction can be granted against them. It doesn't mean to say they're at fault. They, just, they can have an injunction granted against them. Uh, and these are being granted in a number of countries now, um, and Karen's going to talk a bit about what, what happens in, in the UK because she's had examples there, but it's become a process where the platforms don't even bother turning up for the, for the hearings anymore. It's, it's become so kind of simple and, and uh, straightforward. And at the heart of it, there's, there's the principles that it has to be an effective block, it has to be proportionate, it has to be dissuasive, and it's the proportionate that there's, I guess, another movable feast round, which is, well, you know, what do we mean by proportionate? Proportionate taking into account the state of technology, how much you're going after, but also a series of what, what are known as freedoms. So we've never been big on freedoms in Europe. Um, and we've never had a First Amendment or any of those sorts of things. Um, but now there are three potential sets of freedoms. There's, a, there's the freedoms of businesses to, to do business. Um, there's the freedom of content owners to protect their content. And then finally, there's the freedom of of users to, to access information. So far, all the debates have really been between the first of those two, and you haven't really had a voice of the, of the third. But courts are starting to say, well, we should, we should hear some kind of representative of this third freedom, the freedom of the individual user. So having set the scene, hand over to Karen for specifically. Sure. Um, so our, the, the law that um, Mark was just talking about is uh, Article 8.3 of the EU Copyright Directive, and that has been specifically implemented by various member states in the EU, and it was implemented in the UK under something called 97A, and that opened the door to, to bring actions in the UK um, to, to actually block infringing sites. And the first action that the motion picture industry brought in um, the UK it was, was a good first action because you had a very long history with the website that was at issue. It was a website called Newsbin. Um, we'd actually litigated against it directly. Uh, one, gotten a judgment. The site went underground and was being arguably operated anonymously. There were claims it was being operated by different um, operators, which ultimately didn't turn out to be true, but so we refer to this new site as Newsbin2, and that's the site that we sought to block. And the initial action was just asking the largest of the internet service providers, access providers in the UK, which is British Telecom, to block the site Newsbin2. And that was a very contested action. Um, again, as Mark said, there's no requirement to prove liability on the part of um, British Telecom, BT. Uh, but they did have concerns, or professed concerns, obviously, about cost, about the impact on their relationships with their customers. And so they, they did fight that action. Um, ultimately, the court, the high court in the UK, found that the block should be issued, um, denied BT's request that the motion picture studios indemnify them against claims by their customers, denied BT's request um, that we pay for the implementing of the blocking, 
um, and found that the fact that there may be some works available through the site that were public domain or were legitimately being offered uh, where the site was structurally infringing, largely huge percentage infringing, um, that the court really didn't have concerns about that, those small number of works, because the view was of Justice Arnold that you could find those works elsewhere. If you wanted to get to them, they would be available through another form. You didn't need to go to a pirate site. And what we saw after that action was a recognition by the internet service providers in the UK that these sorts of orders could be issued against them. And very quickly, there came a level of cooperation. Not cooperation to the point where the internet service providers are willing to block sites without an order, uh, but cooperation to the point where they don't fight the orders, they don't object to them, and they don't show up at court, um, typically. So there have been a number of blocks by um, various rights holders, not just the motion picture industry, but the recording industry, the sports leagues, other publishers, um, and sites have been blocked in the UK. Um, and there are obviously, could be future issues about costs, et cetera, but that's where we are right now. And it's, it's, it's interesting because of the fact that you do not have to prove liability. It makes a much different dynamic between the rights holders and the internet service providers. So in the US under the DMCA, if you want to get an injunction against Comcast, uh, Verizon, to block a site under the DMCA, you would have to show liability first. And that makes for very hostile exchange. And what we've found is where you're not having to prove the liability, there, there is an opportunity for cooperation and to make the process more streamlined. It's a question. Yeah, question. Um, are, are you, at this point, are you going after just the worst offenders in terms of what kind of pirate sites there are, not a search engine that looks maybe half legitimate, half no, I mean, what's the strategy so far? Right, I mean, in the, in the EU, you're gonna have to show that the site is structurally infringing. So I, I don't think there's a lot of clarity, and Mark can speak to this maybe too, about exactly what that means, but I think what we would think is it's a site where, you know, if you do some kind of a statistical sampling, you think it's not, you find that like 90% of the works are copyrighted works owned by major copyright holders that you know do not give their works away for free with no protection on them. Um, so that, that's been the, the types of targets. I think, um, you know, site block has, it's, it's a narrow relief. It doesn't shut a site down. And so you wouldn't want to be using that unless you're, it's a high traffic, very problematic site, typically. And, and it's, um, although I say it's very easy to get, well, it's somewhat easy to get these things now, they're still taken very seriously by the court. So although the, the telcos don't turn up for the hearings now, the judges each time go through all the, um, you know, criteria very carefully. So, I, you know, I don't think they're just being given for everything. Uh, and they pay a lot of attention to those two criteria, effective and dissuasive. You know, if, it, if you're really only going to get a fairly small amount of stuff, and actually there's a lot of other stuff on the site which is legal, then it's less likely you're going to get blocked. Um, you know, there's a lot of respect being given to this evolving idea of freedoms to do business. Uh, and so there's been an interesting case recently where this, for the first time, got all the way to the most highest European court, the Court of Justice, and they upheld, and this is an Austrian case, uh, it was upheld there that you could have uh, a site blocking, although there have been some questions in other European jur jurisdictions about that. But again, it has to be proportionate, it has to be against the right kind of people, and it can't cut across the, the legitimate freedom to do business. And, the, and there's also been, um, not brought by our members, but brought by the French film companies in, in France, obviously, uh, there has been one action that linked together both the internet service providers and the search engines, the major search engines. That's the Allo streaming case, which I'm sure some of, some of you are familiar with. And there, again, it's just at the trial court level at this point, um, but there was an order requiring both the blocking of the sites and the delisting of the sites by the search engines. And that is going up on appeal and it's going up on a couple of issues, obviously the search engines. I uh, don't think that they should have, uh, the relief should have been granted against them. They don't think it makes sense to have both the site blocking and the delisting. Uh, the lower court found that that did make sense, those two work together, and if you have both things in place, you have a better chance of decreasing traffic and use of the sites. Um, but that, will, that issue will go up on appeal, as will the cost, because there the court actually said uh, that 
that the internet service providers and the search engines could look to the content owners for some you know, coverage of costs. And so the, the plaintiffs, the plaintiff equivalents are appealing as well on the cost issue. So it'll be interesting to see how that all plays out. But I also think what you're going, you're going to see is, I mean, this law is not limited to internet service providers as in access providers. It's much broader than that. It talks about intermediaries being best placed to take action. And so it has been used against hosting providers that are providing the hosting services to require them to cut off hosting. Um, and conceivably could be, and I would expect you to see rights holders testing this in Europe, used against ad networks, used against payment processors, registries, registrars. It's not limited on its terms, although it could be limited by the courts, but that's not how it's written. Well, I think as you get wider in terms of the people you go after, you're going to have, it's going to get harder to be specific and proportionate. I mean, there was another uh, court of justice case where rights owners in Belgium went after a social network. Uh, and there, it was too broad an order they sought. It was just too blanket. And the court said, you can't have that. It's got to be much more specific. And I think dealing with some of these other providers, it's going to be quite difficult to craft the order which actually achieves what you want. Okay. Take this. I'm going to talk about some of the more granular issues that impact uh, a company such as Shutterstock that deals in crowdsourced content. Um, using a couple of specific examples where the laws vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, most notably where the laws vary um, greatly between the U.S. and, say, every other country in the world. Uh, so um, using moral rights and um, architectural rights under copyright law as examples um, to sort of look through that lens. In the U.S., this came up earlier today when we were talking about the Garcia case. If you were in the morning panel, there was a question about moral rights under U.S. law. Uh, sorry, under French law, I will not subject you to my French accent, but it is moral, moral rights, um, which is basically the, the, the right that the uh, author of the content has in um, the integrity and the publication of the content. And integrity is a term used um, generally, I think, outside the U.S. to refer to whether or not a certain use of the content might prejudice the owner, hurt his reputation. Um, so for example, how an image might be used, at least from the perspective of a company like Shutterstock, uh, whether or not you know an image used in a certain way by one of our customers might um, cast the uh, photographer or for the photographer the model of the image in a negative light. Um, in the U.S., there's a very limited protection for moral rights. It's um, under it's it's for uh, limited edition fine artworks and. Uh, not, not generally applicable, not really a useful doctrine to rely on when making a day-to-day -day complaint. Whereas, <coughs> excuse me, in other countries, um, moral rights are a much more expansive doctrine and give the uh, rights owner a lot more you know, power to kind of control how the content is used or to withdraw the content um, or to you know, control how the content is dispersed um, by, by licensees. Um, Shutterstock, again, as an example, is unique and somewhat in this respect. We, we do host content. We're a licensing intermediary uh, between our contributors on the one side, uh, from whom we license content, and to our customers on the other side, to whom we license the content. Um, and so the first um, issue, that the, the, the first kind of consideration for us as we examine the, the lens of global IP protection issues, like whether or not moral rights apply, whether or not they can be waived or transferred. Um, with respect to content that's being licensed on our site is our own terms of service. And I suspect there's another panel on this today um, and how you can use your terms of service to tr transact with your, um, with your customers. But for us, uh, US law is governing law, and it's a contract with our contributors. So they, um, they, do, they do consent to US law. So they say that um, uh, they consent, we're, we're governed by New York law specifically, but um, they agree to, you know, they have the, the right to, um, to license this content and that we have the right to license it out in certain ways. And we have restrictions on, our con on how we can license that content. For example, um, it, it, certain sensitive uses are prohibited, like use in connection with adult escort services or, or something equally offensive, something that would be immoral, uh, derogatory, or unlawful wouldn't be permissible. But beyond that, um, the right is granted to an intermediary licensing company like Shutterstock to do with the content, um, really to license the content however it, it deems appropriate. And the, the contributor grants that. So we're not necessarily subject to all the um, sort of inconsistent laws across the globe. 
uh, in this respect. However, um, for an expanding company, uh, Shutterstock is expanding pretty rapidly. For an expanding company, um, a concept of localization becomes really important. And sometimes um, for you know, tax issues or uh, other reasons, you have to consider whether or not to form an entity in another country. Uh, and for uh, the users who are generating content uh, or the, the, the crowdsource content that we're looking at to be licensed under different laws, um, in which case we would then be subject to those laws. And in which case we would also then be subject to the very subjective standards that define moral rights and when integrity is implicated. Um, generally speaking, countries that have a moral rights um, restriction on the use of content consider reasonableness under the circumstances. Um, so we would look at, uh, in, our, in our license agreement, we would consider, you know, what would a reasonable person find offensive? Not necessarily what would the model or the photographer of that image find offensive, but what would a reasonable person find offensive? Um, at the end of the day, we, uh, you know, most expanding companies have to make a business decision more, um, more often than a legal decision. So what we might consider is not necessarily whether or not we're obligated by Turkish law, for example, to take down content. Um, but if it's, uh, if it's just in the best interests of the company, or if there are certain uh, morality laws in other countries that might influence how, um, how a, a certain model might be de depicted. And this goes back to example of the Garcia case that was being discussed this morning. Um, so there are, um, I've, seen, I've seen examples where um, certain religions have um, a view of the afterlife, for example, and using images of, of certain individuals in connection with a TV show about the afterlife would be absolutely reprehensible in the countries where those images were taken. Um, are we obligated by law not to license images for that, uh, that particular purpose? Uh, not necessarily, but it's, you know, it's again, it's a business decision. The same things apply to, um, you know, a lot of religious considerations or, or uh, homosexuality, for example, in countries, in, you know, in various countries. So we do make decisions, um, you know, when, when issues of moral rights come up, we do make decisions that are um, probably more business minded. In other situations, our, our hands are forced because uh, using architectural works, for example, um, some types of content. Uh, buildings, for example, might be protected in foreign countries, images of buildings. Um, it wouldn't be permitted to take an image and license it for commercial purposes, whereas maybe in the U.S. you could do that. Um, so we often get, uh, we would have to respond to demands for compulsory license fees, um, which implicates fair use questions, among others. But uh, generally speaking, we, um, there are, for an expanding online business considering global IP protection is issues with respect to how very granular copyright issues relate to content. Um, it's almost always a business decision. Well, this might, I'd certainly be interested in, in hearing from our panelists and, and perhaps the audience could share as well. Um, what is the effect of a choice of law provision in a contract? Um, certainly, uh, an issue arises as to whether that alone can um, rule out or preclude the application of the law of a foreign country in which case in in which the uh, offense arises. I had a case on moral rights which I, I thought was quite um, apropos when you were speaking um, to illustrate how uh, when you least expect it um, your case can have an international um, application. Um, I'm based in Toronto. Uh, a fellow came to me from Quebec. Um, uh, the situation related to a painting. Uh, he has, had done something in Cuba. He was a Cuban artist. Um, he opened up the television in uh, Quebec and he found that the photo of lips appeared in the background of a retailer's commercial on clothing. And this photo had been manipulated because really it wasn't just one set of lips, which was his, his uh, rendering, but it was uh, kind of a mosaic of the lips. Like it was a repetition of the lips over and over and over to the point where it became the wallpaper behind a clothing ad. Now, what is the likelihood of somebody uh, turning on the television in a foreign jurisdiction finding that something he'd, he'd painted in another foreign jurisdiction was actually being aired with respect to a commercial 
never heard about, of course, want to complain, comp want to claim compensation. Now, in Canada, we actually have a statutory provision um, which says that the moral rights are deemed to be infringed, deemed, no fault, if, if there is use in a certain situation which is advertising, not morally reprehensible necessarily, but certainly within that context, you're toast. Uh, if you're a user and, and that arises. And I, I know we have some experts in photography in, in the uh, panel here, so they, they may kind of uh, contribute to this one. So what, what uh, well, I'm looking at one of them. He may not want to volunteer. But <laughs> so my question really is, um, in, in today's era, can you really say we choose this particular law New York, whatever, where we know that the U.S. has a very low standard of protection of moral rights. I mean, I, I think Dr. Arpad Bosch, the, the, uh, the, we're told, wanted U.S. to join the Berne Convention so badly that wrote a letter to say, don't worry, you already have moral rights, you're fine, you're in. Um, whereas other countries, such as France and, and civil law, certainly in, um, Canada being a mosaic of both, um, might take a different stance. Can you rule out the applicability of a foreign uh, law, even if you choose a particular law? Uh, I, I think it's, can, it's a little easier if everyone can hear me. Um, I, it's, it's complicated, uh, for starters. <laughs> and to answer the question that you didn't ask, the likelihood that somebody in a foreign country would turn on the TV and see an image reproduced in some form or another, it, it turns out is really high. Uh, because we see issues like this all the time and it's rather shocking. Um, I will also tell everyone here for your reference that you all have a doppelganger in the world. Um, I promise you. <laughs> um, but it, what, what you're asking, um, at least from the perspective of a company like Shutterstock, and I'm not speaking exactly you know, as Shutterstock in this instance, um, is, is not, um, it, it's, the answer is imprecise because if you're just talking about the relationship that we have with our contributors, who license content to us, it's contractual. And so before we ever get to a copyright question, we would typically answer a contract question. And does the contract set the rules and the boundaries for our relationship? And does that contract permit us to uh, be governed by New, New York law? Um, what I think the question that you're asking more generally probably relates to a third party, in which case the, the more complicated and fuzzier answer is no, we couldn't just say, um, only New York law applies here. We're in the U.S., we're a U.S. company. Sorry, your moral rights don't matter. Um, and, and that's not appropriate because the, uh, we, have, we, we can't claim what our contract claims because most likely we don't have privity with the party who's, who's claiming that his rights have been infringed. Um, and when a, a you know, licensing agency gets a third-party complaint that sounds in copyright and we can't rely on our contract, then of course we look to the laws of the foreign jurisdiction and if we don't defer to them, then we would at least consider them and make a reasonable decision under the circumstances. And that picks up on the, on the question of jurisdiction, doesn't it? And you know, the reason you, you have these choice of laws clauses is, is because it's convenient, really. You don't want people suing you in other countries. And if you're someone in the other country and you want to sue, then it's a pain to have to go to that country to sue. And what we're seeing in the UK is a move where, not where it's contract, where it's something else, where there's an infringement in another country, a move towards the UK court, the English court, deciding, well, actually, we'll take jurisdiction and we'll apply that country's law. So we had a case that went to the Supreme Court uh, for a film company that was trying to stop someone selling uh, replica, replica props um, into the US. And he was based in the UK. They tried suing him in the US. They got summary judgment, but that was unenforceable in the UK because he never he never turned up. He never uh, consented to jurisdiction. Um, but then the UK court w went to the Supreme Court and they said, you know, you can the UK court can apply US copyright law. So we had expert evidence of US copyright law, and we got a decision, and we got damages, and, and that was the end of it. So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that these boundaries between countries are increasingly falling away, and what the court's really looking at is domicile. Where is the defendant? Um, you know, if you've got a cause, of, if you've got a defendant, and you can sue them in that domicile, you can apply another country's laws in some circumstances. I mean, I would just add as well. I mean, I think it's somewhat driven by the business model. You know, there was, you know, I think most you know, intermediaries are interested in providing very localized experience and to the extent that they are offering services you know, in a language. You know, the terms of service are offered in that language. They're trying to provide local news relevant to that population. I think the argument gets much, much harder that you shouldn't be subject to to the local laws and you can't impose sort of a you know, US-centric view of choice of law 
And, and Heidi mentioned earlier, and I really think it's true, you know, the, the analysis of whether you set up an entity in that country and sort of how you capitalize that entity, I think all of those factors uh, are a consideration in recognizing the reality that you may well be subject to local law. And, and whether or not you want to be in that country because of those local laws. <laughs> when you're dealing with content, have you, have you found user-generated content to be uh, an, an issue which uh, is troubling you and, and the business model anyway? Um, certainly in, in some jurisdictions, the, the notion of um, fair dealing and uh, uh, exceptions for user-generated content of a non-commercial nature uh, seem to be gaining some traction. I can speak to this first, but I, I will say that I use the term user-generated content lightly because we, you know, Shutterstock doesn't fit into that traditional model, um, so we're crowdsourced content, <laughs> so it's a little bit different, but, um, and also we're a commercial enterprise as a licensing agency, so the question of fair use might apply to our customers um, and not necessarily to us, but uh, generally speaking, when it, when it comes to, you know, the analysis, the fair use analysis in the U.S. versus the rest of the world, um, you know, we, we rely on the First Amendment and we have these expansive rights in the U.S. and we can do so much with content. And outside the U.S., uh, you know, it's much more, at least in, from my perspective, it, it becomes much more narrow analysis, um, which probably relates back to, you know, the last question you asked, which is, um, you know, who's making the complaint and where is that person? Um, is it a third party or is it somebody with whom we've contracted and, you know, where we can make an argument about, uh, you know, whether or not a fair use exception might apply, or just at the end of the day, it's a business decision. Do we really want to engage in that argument? Do we want that kind of attention? We, we, we have fair dealing, not fair use, which is a narrow series of exceptions for specific uses. I think most cases, it ends up in the same place as US law. Uh, we just approach it differently. There's, there's every now and again, there's a political move towards, well, we, you know, we should have fair use. There was, there was one three years ago and started the reason we didn't have our equivalent of Silicon Valley was because we didn't have fair use laws, um, which the Prime Minister himself spouted, and, and that does, hasn't really gone anywhere. Um, but every now and again, it becomes a political issue. And, and I think actually somewhere in here, you know, political issues pay a big part in the way these policies develop. And certainly there's been a pushback in Europe, partly because of NSA and partly because of the taxes issues, where a lot of the things which were in favor of platforms and tech companies are now, you know, there's a big resistance to them, which I think is unfortunate. You know, it's not really helping the law develop at all. And to what extent do you think that um, protection for concepts is, is gaining ground in general? Um, and and I'm, t I'm thinking both in terms of eligibility for protection and also on enforceability. So to the extent that um, the idea expression uh, dichotomy find its, finds its application uh, in copyright, or perhaps this is really at the heart of the method patents and software patentability issues. Um, aren't, aren't we perhaps really dealing with the same principle, which is defining the limits of IP protection? And how do we do it industry by industry or sector by sector? Are, is, is that whole debate finding its expression in a different way in different sectors? And, and I thought that I would ask Brett first, because uh, really it relates a lot to <coughs> the software patentability and do we use utility models and can we find some sort of other uh, tool in that toolbox when we're trying to enhance the portfolio of the company and, and support their business model? I mean, I, I'm, I just personally believe that there should be broad subject matter eligibility in patents with a relatively high threshold for non-obviousness or inventive step, and let, let it all kind of sort itself out there. The, the, like a lot of litigators don't like that because then you can't uh, get a, a summary, um, summary uh, motion for summary judgment granted early in the case when you have these more murky issues that can only be resolved later. But I think it's because technology is moving so quickly what constitutes a concept or a business method, it's just so fluid that to define rules that preclude certain areas feels, feels very much like a Band-Aid and not addressing the core, core issues. I mean, I, I really agree with, with Brad and particularly what he said at the end in terms of you know, what sort of intuitively feels right. I mean, I, I was thinking when you were asking the question, you know, 
if you go back 10 or 12 years ago, you know, there was discussion, particularly in the literature at that time, about whether we needed to modify laws to be applicable to the internet. And, and ultimately, whether it was for lack of creativity in the legal you know, group, I don't know. But you know, we didn't. You know, we applied the same laws. And I do think that that's the right decision. I mean, I think the laws you know, do lend themselves in a way that they can be applied. And so I would, intuitively, to me, it doesn't seem right that we would have sort of a, a different approach sector by sector. And the laws would apply equally. And I would just echo what I said about having high standards and having them apply broadly. I would just add one more thing is that the, I don't want to focus too much on utility models in this, but you know, one interesting thing is back in Germany, when this was founded, it was really meant to cover sub-patentable and sort of fill the gap between patents and design rights, right? And I think, to some extent, that was they were only thinking about it in terms of simple mechanical inventions. But the, the basic concept of you know, patents having sort of a very high threshold for protection, utility models maybe less, copyrights somewhat maybe moving into the expression of an idea. I mean, it just it feels like there's a spectrum of very broad guidelines that could be used to cover almost anything without being too specific, whether it's mechanical or software or business method. That all feels too superficial to me. And Mark, do you find that there's a different le a level of, uh, of eligibility depending on which sector you're working in? I know that you work um, in various sectors. I, no, I don't think so particularly. And I think actually we're very lined up probably with the US on this. I mean, the, um, the recent Oracle case was interesting, which is another, you know, was, is, is that protectable code or is that an idea? Um, and I think the way that came out was absolutely the same as the, the case just before it, or between SAS and WPL and the CJU came out, you know, that, that certain types of code is protectable and concepts are not. Uh, so I think we probably have a very similar approach, and I'm not sure any particular, I mean, you know, people are still inventing game shows, and there's still money in game shows, so I think even the most ephemeral concepts, you know, can be protected somehow. Well, do we have time for questions for our panelists? We're just uh, wrapping up, but if, if anyone has any questions, I, I am told that their panelists would welcome them. We have a question. I mean, it is and it isn't because, as I mentioned before, site blocking and, and the kinds of injunctive relief that you can get, um, it's not going to end the operation of a website. So um, in the EU, if we were litigating directly against the website itself, you would typically get a pretty narrow judgment. It would probably pertain to a specific small group of film titles or a small group of works that you put in evidence on. And it wouldn't be, you wouldn't get broad injunctive relief. You wouldn't get an order that would actually shut the site down. You wouldn't get a large monetary award. There's no statutory damage scheme. So I think each system has its advantages to rights holders. Um, obviously, litigating a site blocking action or another one of these no fault injunctive type actions is, is going to cost a lot less than bringing a large US litigation against a, a website. So I see them as more tools that you just need to take advantage of what law is favorable to you in the jurisdiction. And I wouldn't actually say, you know, my colleagues in the EU always say, well, you have statutory damages, so it's more hospitable to right, rights holders in the US. Um, but it's certainly a, a valuable tool because it's recognition of the role that intermediaries play, I think, really has, creates large potential for cooperative agreements that don't require any litigation at all. Once you've got an acknowledgement that everyone has a role to play in addressing piracy, that sort of sets a playing field where you can reach some agreements where people you know, enforce their own terms of service on copyright infringement and there's not a necessity for you to bring a court action. Um, and that may be a more favorable landscape in the, in the EU right now. Another question? Uh, my question is for Joseph. Uh, I saw on the slide that said 
Shia turns that back this way. Right? Pointing out that usually the word non-provisional in the US directly to GCC is changed the form. So uh, assuming our US applications are good, is there anything more specific yeah. that you would, you would want to add? The only thing I would say is that the uh, amendment practice for utility models is very limited in general. So if you take a U.S. approach and file broad claims in your U.S. case, and then understanding that you're going to amend them over the course of you know, prosecution, that option may not be available for you for a utility model. And then you're going to have a, 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 a set of overly broad app, uh, patents uh, or utility models that ultimately won't stand up in court. So I would say craft the claims that you think are really going to survive. You know, do the work up front, do your prior art search, craft good claims, and pursue them as a utility model. And you've, you've got a shot at, at real protection, I think. Well, please join me in thanking all of our panelists. <laughs>